go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Is Christian culture declining? I think we can all kind of agree to that, but we've invited today the Pipe Cottage to be on the program today. Now, you may or you may not be familiar with the Pipe Cottage. Dr. Alan Harrelson has a most uh, splendid Southern accent. He's also got a very interesting take on the Christian culture, the link between Southern culture, Christian culture, the decline in society in general, and maybe even the lasting consequences in the war between the states, which yesterday, yesterday marked the end of hostilities with the surrender from General Lee to General Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse in the very parlor of Wilmer McLean's house there, which I was there recently. So we're going to talk a lot about the decline of Christian culture and the symptoms thereof with Dr. Alan Harrelson at 30 past the hour. But there are lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me. And today at the uh, 14 past break, we're going to talk or actually we're going to play a game. I think we're going to play a game. We're going to do a first ever game show here on a Catholic take, it's called, Is This Blasphemy? Let that sink in for a second. Speaking of which, turns out that his eminence Cardinal Fernandez is saying that it might be time to change. We might need to change this whole idea that homosexuality is intrinsically disordered. Ruminate on that for a moment. So there's a lot to talk about in the decline of Christian culture today. We're going to be linking to everything we discuss in the show notes over at the stationofthecross.com forward slash A C. T. Let's pray. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear. And answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now your saint of the day. Holy Ezekiel the prophet, pray for us. Ezekiel, whose name in Hebrew means God is strong or whom God strengthens, was an Israelite priest and the son of a priest named Buzi. After Jerusalem fell to the pagan Babylonians, Ezekiel and his wife were expelled from the city, like many other Jews, and taken in captivity to Babylon. After about five years in this exile, Ezekiel received a vision of various forms of angels, including the wheels within wheels that are identified as thrones in the angelic hierarchy. These angels were shown to be serving God, who appeared in the likeness of a man upon a sapphire throne. The Lord gave Ezekiel a commission as a prophet, which Ezekiel would fulfill for over 20 years. St. John quotes Ezekiel many times throughout the book of Apocalypse. Ezekiel is also the source of Our Lady's title, Porta Celi, or Gate of Heaven. The traditional Roman martyrology relates that Ezekiel was executed in Babylon by the judge of the Israelites because Ezekiel rebuked him for idolatry. He is also mentioned on July 23rd in the modern calendar. For more about this day and others in the church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saints and seasons. Holy Ezekiel, pray for us. And now your headline news. The Hill reports Arizona Supreme Court upholds 1864 law banning nearly all abortions. In a 42 decision, the court rejected arguments that it should uphold the 15-week abortion ban passed by then-Governor Doug Ducey back in 2022 and enforced after the end of Roe v. Wade. Instead, the court ruled that the Civil War era law passed before Arizona was even a state should be enforced. The court ruled to lift the stay on the law, meaning it goes into effect in 14 days. The law makes abortion a felony punishable by two to five years in prison for anyone who performs or helps a woman to obtain one. 
It includes an extremely narrow exception for, quote, when it is necessary, close quote, to save the pregnant person's life. Voters can remove the restrictions through a ballot measure in November. LifeSite News reports Melania Trump to host a Mar-a-Lago fundraiser for pro-homosexual log cabin Republicans. Former First Lady Melania Trump is reportedly set to return to the campaign trail for her husband, starting with a fundraiser for homosexual conservative group Log Cabin Republicans at her and her husband Donald's resort home of Mar-a-Lago. The Log Cabin Republicans advocate for homosexual marriage, homosexual adoption, which has led to numerous cases of child sex abuse, a nationwide ban on so-called conversion therapy, Enforcing government-assisted adoption agencies to place children in same-sex households, among other things. Hmm. What again are they conserving? One more time. Catholic Vote reports, poll, Latino voters switching from Biden to Trump. According to a new poll, Hispanic and Latino voters are increasingly turning on President Joe Biden in favor of presumptive Republican nominee former President Donald Trump. At the same time, the poll shows that Latino voters still heavily identify with and may be slightly trending toward the Democratic Party. Ipso senior vice president Chris Jackson observed that among the polled Latino voters, in almost every case, Trump performs better than the Republican brand and Biden performs worse than the Democratic brand. Those those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from John chapter three. Verses 16 through 21. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that he, that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light, so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works might be clearly seen as done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Could you imagine standing there looking Jesus in the eye, the God-man, the the, the person with the hypostatic union, he's both perfectly God and perfectly man, all at the same time. The only begotten Son, the incarnate Word, took upon flesh and dwelt among us, staring you, looking you straight in the eyes and saying, if you have evil works, then you hate the light. Whew. Let that sink in about how our evil deeds offend God and how so greatly offended he truly is, as the Blessed Mother has warned us in Fatima and other locations. In her coming, Father McKeevely says in this verse, our Lord, as if answering an objection which might present itself to Nicodemus, uh, visa Nicodemus says, why should the son of God be suspended on an an ignominious gibbet assigns the true efficient cause vis-a-vis the boundless love of God for man? Every word is expressive and suggestive. So, to such a boundless extent, with such mighty effort and vehemence, did God, not a king or an emperor, but God, this infinite being, infinite in all perfections, love freely and gratuitously. Without any claim on him, the world, all mankind, his enemy by sin, as to give, deliver over to torture and punishment, not for his own, but for their outrages and sins, his only begotten, his natural son. What a mystery of godliness. God becoming man, the highest and lowest united, the greatest creator showing his love for a wretched, sinful worm of the earth by submitting to excruciating, ignominious tortures. What love, what what boundless love God has given to us. The Ignatius Catholic Study Bible would say, condemned already, unbelief, is a form of rebellion that puts offenders outside the safety of the covenant. Let me just repeat that because I think it's important. Condemned already, 
Unbelief is a form of rebellion that puts offenders outside the safety of the covenant. To reject the Son of God is to reject the light of faith in preference to spiritual darkness, death, and disinheritance. You are outside the safety of the covenant if you are in rebellion with God. A Catholic commentary in Holy Scripture said, quoting St. Augustine, St. Augustine's application is justly celebrated. Many loved their sins and many confessed their sins. He who confesses and accuses his sins is already on God's side. God, that is the light, accuses your sins. And if you also accuse, you are joined to God. And where does one accuse? Where does one confess? In the confessional, of course, as we saw here in this Easter octave that we just experienced. Jesus appears to his disciples in the upper room eight days after eight days, and he breathes the Ruah, the breath of God, bringing us straight back to Genesis chapter 2, when God formed Adam and then breathed his life into him, the Ruah of God. He breathes upon his apostles and says, whatever sins you bind are bound, whatever sins you loosed are loosed. You must confess your sins to one another, as we are told in the New Testament. And we see here that the apostles, these priests in the New Testament, have the power to bind and loose. We are to go into the tribunal, to the confessional, and we are to accuse ourselves that we might be on God's side and in the rebellion in our hearts that we might enter the light because the darkness is creeping up ever so much. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. More to come. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, coming up at uh, 30 past the hour, we're going to have a very special guest on. Dr. Alan Harrelson is going to be our guest. He is with the Pipe Cottage. You might be familiar with his work. He was fairly recently on the Matt Frad Pints with Aquinas podcast, which was pretty amazing conversation. He loves to smoke a pipe. He's a professor of history and an expert in Southern culture. And we're going to talk about the decline of Christian culture, the link to Southern culture, and maybe the lasting consequences between in the war between the states that uh, yesterday we marked the occasion of the ending of hostilities with the surrender of Lee to Grant in, McLean, in Wilmer McLean's living room there in Appomattox Courthouse. That's coming up at uh, 15 past the hour. But there are lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. But today, rather than just read you another article, I think we should play a little game. What do you say? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's time to play Blasphemy with your host, Joe McLean. Oh, yeah. I found a little video yesterday and I thought, wow, would I ever love to get your opinion. So today we're going to play a little game. I'm going to play a clip for you. I'll explain. I'll do narration. I'll do play by play so you can hear every little juicy detail of what's going down here. But I want your opinion. We got a poll up over on the YouTube feed right now. We want to know, do you think that what I'm about to play for you is, in fact, blasphemy. Now, I want you to take this into the context of we live in a fallen world and a declining Christian world at that. We are post-Christendom. So this is a little video, and uh, spoiler alert, it's a commercial that runs in Italy. It's in Italian. I'm going to give you the play-by-play, but uh, I don't want to give you too many spoilers. Let's just click play and see how it goes. So right now, what we're seeing is a convent, a convent with some young ladies dressed all in white, processing towards what we think is a chapel. And then we cut to a scene and a now older woman in full habit, full habit, I mean, not even like a modern habit, like a full habit. She's not Sister Pansu. No, no, no. She's got the full habit on, but she's open a cabinet and she's reaching in for what looks like a chalice. Is this a tabernacle? Where exactly are we? Well, as we play, we realize, wait, hold on. We're in a sacristy here. She must be the sacristan for the convent. And she reaches and grabs that chalice to look inside. What does she see? But nothing. 
She looks around. Pot, like, what's going on here? I'm missing something. The chalice is empty from the sacristy. It's, it's empty. And she's looking to fill it with something, apparently. The next thing we do is we cut to a scene of the chapel itself. And it looks to be like an actual chapel of some kind anyway. Apparently in Italy, made to be looking very, very old. I was just there. I saw lots of chapels that might be similar to this one. This appears to be a a traditional Latin mass, high altar that faces ad orientum. I see it's, uh, you know, with gold. It's laid out with gold, but no actual, uh, you know, cloth on top. That's very fascinating. And is this a pontifical mass? There's at least one, two, three, four, five, six candles. It's is that a pontifical high mass? What are we talking about here? The uh, the uh, the tabernacle door is open, but it looks like there's a monstrance exposed from inside. Interesting. Father is wearing a full black cassock with only a stole, no chasuble, but he is apparently has the the uh, the chalice in his hands, and he's now approaching what looks to be a kneeler, where we will see the young. Ladies in white approach for communion, and she receives standing and on the tongue. Although, you know, it's interesting to see a chapel that's at Orientum, yet are standing and on the tongue, and she has her eyes closed, piously receiving what we would all think would be the Lord, until we hear that crunch, that crunch, and the look in her eye, like the surprise. What? What is this? What have I just taken on the tongue? Father begins to look down at the chalice, apparently, because his glasses are seven to eight inches thick, it looks like, looking down to his own surprise to discover not consecrated hosts of the Lord, but rather potato chips filling his chalice. Now, everyone looks over to the sacristan, off to the side, a girthy woman, again, in full habit, eating a bag of amica chips. With a look on her face that says, yeah, and? Hmm, so that begs the question, is this blasphemy? Therein lies the question for us today. Do you think that this is a blasphemous kind of commercial? Do you think it's just insensitive kind of commercial? I would love to know what your opinion is of the matter. So we are, in fact, taking a poll right now over on the on the Live YouTube feed. Producer Jake, how does that poll stand as of right now? So it looks like we've got 26 votes so far, and we've got 96 say yes, 0% say no, 4% say disrespectful, but not blasphemous. Hmm. Mm. Isn't that something? So I don't know about you, but I think this is terribly offensive in a number of ways, but not the, not the least of which is the fact that this is an Italian commercial we're going to link to it in the show notes so you can watch it again for yourself and take it all in its full glory here but it's an italian commercial italy out of all places do you think italy should have a commercial do you think italian society would tolerate a commercial that is sacrilegious at the very least blasphemous at the most i mean i don't think we should be comfortable with it even if you don't consider it blasphemy i think it's it's very, very, very disrespectful to say the very least. But that is exactly where we are at. You know, I, I looked up some reports and I saw this one here. Hostility against churches is on the rise in the United States alone. Or again, I'm going to link to this. This comes out of the Family Research Council. There's a couple of interesting findings out of this report that I want to share with you, in fact. Number one, that uh, there were 915 acts of hostility over the past six years. 915, and they, they, they range in a, a wide variety of attacks. They could be uh, vandalism. They could just be like throwing a brick through a window, for instance. The arson is, in some cases, spray painting, graffiti, physical attacks. It's all of them added up. So 915 attacks just in the United States alone over the past six years. But here's the real kicker of the report, in my opinion. When you look at it, it from 2022 to 2023 is more than double the increase. Yeah, more than double the increase of attacks against churches in the United States just in 2023. There is a hockey stick increase in America on attacks in the Catholic Church or just all all churches in general. They don't specify yeah through denominations necessarily. 
even though the Catholic Church isn't a denomination, just saying that aloud. But anyway, uh, but here's the other kicker. So you have a more than double increase in 2023 alone. What happened in 2023? We should be pondering this. But the month, the month that was the worst in 2023, June. June. What happens in June? Could it be the month of the Sacred Heart at on display here being attacked by the month of the Rainbow Warriors? Asking for a friend. Maybe just maybe this year, this June, you might prepare by getting a, a nice, beautiful flag of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Maybe like the one that's uh, right behind Trad Jack Burton there in the Buffalo studio and display it proudly in front of your home because you stand with the light and not the darkness. So America, America, you know, good old America, the conservative America, well, stuff is not getting very good here. It's getting worse by the day. Um, But it's also not great overseas, by the way. Um, On the global level, a Pew Research study we're going to link to in the show notes, key findings from the Global Religious Futures Project seems to indicate that most, most of the world's population is declining in religion. Christianity is in particularly falling. But even when you compare it to Islam, you know, Christianity is flatlining and declining. Islam is skyrocketing right now across the world i want you to take this all in take this all in let this ruminate for you for a moment here that the world is in fact declining from a religious perspective but especially from a christian perspective right now another pew research study i found said eight in ten americans say religion is losing influence in public life religion is losing influence in public life, which brings me back to the video that I was uh, starting this segment with. Is it blasphemy? You know, you might recall, I guess it was probably, I don't know, two months ago or so that I, uh, I, I found this article out of Italy. And the article talked about how in Rome, right now in Italy, there was a giant rise, a spike and Italians going back to pagan cultures, actually performing pagan rituals, going to old Roman ruined pagan sites and pagan temples to bring back the pagan gods of the Roman Empire. This in Italy, of all places, this is the, this is the country of, of St. Francis, of, of so many, St. Anthony of Padua. I mean, so many incredible saints of the Holy Catholic faith. I mean, this is the place where St. Ignatius of, of Antioch was offered to the lions in 110 AD, where he wrote to the Romans before he even showed up. He wrote the letter and sent it ahead. And he was, he was hanging out with Polycarp there. And he wrote the letter and sent it ahead of him because he knew, he knew that when he arrived, they would desperately try to save him from being eaten by lions in the Roman Colosseum, or was it in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the Circus Maximus. It's hard to tell. I talked about that in my documentary film, by the way, which is available on the iCatholic Radio Premium tab on the, on the mobile app. Just download the iCatholic Radio mobile app today. But he wrote ahead of them and he says, I intend to be ground like the wheat of the Holy Eucharist and the mouth of the lion. He intended to become like the flesh of Christ, consumed by the faithful. He intended to be consumed by the lion. He was so stalwart, so determined. He was going to goad the lions into eating them, eating him. He didn't want even his bones to be left over so that they wouldn't be a trouble to the local Catholics there in Rome in 110 AD. Go back and read his epistle to the Romans. I think it will inspire you to be sure, but I want to say it should challenge you. Because as I talk about in my documentary film, um, The Secret of the Saints in the End Times, the last dying wish of Saints Peter and Paul was that we would avoid the great apostasy that was coming. When you read their last and final testimony, Second Peter, uh, for instance, Second Timothy for St. Paul, Second Peter for Peter, when you read their final and last testimony, their last will and testament to us, the faithful, They are warning us about the great apostasy that would come and that how we as Christians 
would, who have been given the greatest gift, the greatest grace known to creation in all of history, that the only begotten son would come and take upon flesh and dwell amongst us and give us his flesh and his blood as food, as true food for our journey towards the promised land, and that we would turn like a dog back to our vomit. It would be better that we would have never been born. The warning was right there. And yet, and yet we see the symptom of a greater problem in the Italians, in the United States, and around the world. We have turned towards the darkness rather than the light. So if you have voted, this is blasphemy, I am on your team. You are a winner because that video was truly blasphemous indeed, and it should be rejected. Let us pray, fast, and do penance for those that would reject Christ. More is coming up next. Are you looking for a simple, creative, and easy way to contribute to the Station of the Cross? Why not consider a transfer of stock or donating a mutual fund gift to help support us in our work of evangelization? Transferring a gift of long-term appreciated stocks, those owned for more than one year, can provide significant tax advantages by allowing you to deduct the fair market value while paying no capital gain tax. Today, most stock transfers are easily made electronically from your broker. Just call us at 1-877-888-6279. That's 1-877-888-6279. Your broker will need to indicate the number of shares being transferred and the QCIP number of the shares. May God bless you for considering a gift to the Station of the Cross so that we can continue proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity for years to come. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Just the News reports, Idaho team planned to attack churches in support of ISIS. Alexander Scott Mercurio, 18 years old, was arrested over the weekend and charged with attempting to provide material support to a terrorist organization. Mercurio began expressing his desire to fight for ISIS in October of 2022, and the FBI arrested him one day before he planned to execute a suicide attack on Christians in his hometown. The day Mercurio was arrested, he sent a video of himself pledging his allegiance to ISIS and its deceased leader while expressing his desire to die for Islam. Catholic News Agency is reporting Pope Francis appoints new bishop of Charlotte, North Carolina. Pope Francis has accepted the resignation of Bishop Peter Jurgis and appointed Monsignor Michael Martin, OFM Conventual, as the leader of the, so- of the Southern U.S. Diocese. Jurgis, 67 years old, has served as the bishop there since 2003 and will continue to assist the diocese as Bishop Emeritus. The official newspaper of the diocese said in an announcement that Jurgis has retired due to health limitations. A chronic but not life-threatening kidney condition made it difficult for him to preside over lengthy liturgies and travel across the 46 counties of the expansive diocese. And Catholic Vote reports Soros Fund Management Investing in Radio. The fund management company founded by left-wing billionaire George Soros has been investing significantly in the audio and radio industry, a recent report highlighted. Though the company claims it is merely a good move for business, Soros fund management's investments could be intended to combat the growing number and popularity of conservative podcasts, wrote journalist Max Tanney for global news outlet Semaphore back on April the 7th. Golly gee whiz. Where are the George Soros's funding our apostolates? You know what I'm saying? We need somebody on our side of that equation. Those, those are headline news. Praise be to God. Hey, are you familiar with the Pipe Cottage? Now, this is a fantastic channel. There's actually two channels we're linking to, Pipe Cottage and Dr. Alan Harrelson. He's a history professor. He is a uh, uh, an extraordinary Southern gentleman, I would argue, and he is uh, either coming into the church or he's a convert to the church. We're going to put a link to his website as well. Fascinating person. He's truly uh, fascinated me on a number of levels. And one of the ones that we want to talk about today is the link between Southern culture, uh, the decline of Christian culture overall, and maybe the lasting 
lasting consequences in the war between the states. We're going to talk about that right now with Dr. Alan Harrelson, who joins us. Good morning to you, Dr. Harrelson. Joe, it's a privilege to be here with you. I've been looking forward to this, and I hope we can have a few minutes of colorful conversation this morning. Yay and amen. Praise be to God. I hate to say this right out of the gate, but my internal dialogue, everyone has an internal dialogue. Mine always sounds like a a southern redneck. So if I break out into accent, I don't mean to be flippant in any way. It just is what it is. Uh, Dr. Harrelson, thank you for your time today. History, I was, by the way, the 10th grade history student of the year in my high school. So I consider myself a historian and an expert. Uh, And I am fascinated by the connection here. In the last segment, I sort of touched upon like Pew Research Studies, the the Family Research Council, their studies, global studies that indicate, I would argue, beyond the shadow of a doubt, the decline of Christian culture. We are living in a post-Christendom era. I think that's obvious to most everybody at this point. Even Richard Dawkins is lamenting the decline of Christian culture. But I want to talk about the Southern culture in connection to that, because it's something that you've talked about on your YouTube videos. Let me just ask you right right out of the gate here. So yesterday marked the anniversary of General Lee surrendering to General Grant in the in the in the living room of Wilmer McLean in the Appomattox Courthouse. Do you believe that Southern culture was a better example of Christian culture overall than the North was during the uh, Civil War period of our country? Oh, absolutely. I have never questioned that. Actually, by uh, and we were, by the way, confirmed in the Catholic Church uh, in November of last year. So we're Congratulations. in the, uh, the fold. We're in the fold now. But um, welcome home. I've been studying the American South and the Civil War for 20 years, the vast majority of my life. Um, and, and since studying Catholicism, it has become apparent to me that um, Alan Tate, who was one of the Southern agrarians who wrote in 1930 an essay about uh, Southern religion, he argued in that essay that uh, one of the reasons the South was not able to win that war is because it did not have a proper religion uh, to support the pre-modern and pre-capitalist society that it had developed. Uh, And by that, he meant that the South would have been better off had it been Catholic from the beginning and had it remained Catholic throughout the 19th century. I think that the American South is a final bastion of Western civilization and Christendom uh, on the North American continent. And I have gone on record uh, as saying that. And and I believe that historically, that's more than speculation. That is an absolute fact. Flannery O'Connor, Flannery O'Connor once said that perhaps the day might come when um, the spiritual traditions of the American South can best be preserved through the Catholic Church. And Mm. I think we are very, very close to that point. Uh, People are converting to Catholicism across the South, particularly uh, 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 people who are thinking, uh, individuals who are interested in intellectual matters. So, yeah, uh, I think that uh, we're still reeling from the effects of the war in many regards. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into all of those details this morning. Well, we might get into some of it anyway. What, what, what part of the, what fascinates me is back in 2018, I was filming a documentary film on the father wound, and I ended up making a stop over at Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I felt like God was asking me to tell a story there. So I dug in and I found a story and I included it in my film, the story of Sergeant Thomas Higgins in the 99th Illinois. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but my great, great, great grandfather fought for the 6th Missouri Confederate at Vicksburg. And so there's a link there that goes in my family that I find even more profound. But in that in that time, I rediscovered the Civil War in a way that was never taught to me in high school, never taught to me even in the classes I took in college, for instance, or many of the books that I used to read. I just you just never see this side of uh, of history, and it's far more complex than I think we're being taught. In fact, that I would argue there's a revisionist history today in education. Do you see it that way, or Americans? given sort of like the uh like the winner take all the to the victor go the spoils does the winner get to decide how history is told 
Yes, unfortunately, but the, also unfortunately is we don't have a strong historical consciousness in modern American society. There's not much interest in history at all, whether it's uh, Civil War, Southern, whatever the case may be. But if anybody does pay attention to the way Civil War history, the narrative is produced by the history profession, it's very, very clear that these people are following a uh, uh, a liberal Marxist point of view. They're using the Civil War as a way to promote a current political agenda. Uh, the greatest uh, attack, the greatest affront to modern liberalism, again, I would say, can be found in the American South. Uh, but the, the difference is not simply urban and rural. I mean, excuse me, the difference is not simply North and South anymore. Uh, there's a rural and urban divide in this country, which is interesting because the Catholic Church is primarily urban across America, but there's, I think, a, an uptick in people in rural America who are interested in, in Catholicism. But um, how does this uh, all relate to the Civil War? Well, um, the, the, there is, the, there's, there's three primary, primary things that separate the South from the rest of the country uh, during the uh, antebellum period, and I think it's still the case in many ways now. Um, uh, defiance towards external authority. Uh, people in the South are not really interested in other people telling them how to live their lives. And that's one of the main sticking points for people in the South who want to convert to the Catholic Church. Um, uh, number two, a high respect and regard for the past. And uh, number three, uh, a, a respect for an agricultural civilization. Now, all of these things were challenged to some degree in the 1860s, and we're still dealing with the effects of it now. Uh, and actually, and where I was raised in South Carolina, it was seldom called the Civil War. It was called the War of Northern Arrogance, <laughs> <laughs> or the late unpleasantness, as it was often called in Charleston. Uh, so I have very, very strong feelings about uh, the 1860s and and how we are still dealing with the loss of the Confederacy. Now, a lot of people may think that um, just because one side of the conflict m maintained chattel slavery and the other side didn't, that the conflict was about slavery. Uh, Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, said that the institution of slavery was merely the finger that pulled the trigger on a musket that had been capped and loaded for several generations. Mm. It's an intensely complex issue. Uh, the complexity uh, of the Civil War period is something that the history profession has failed to uh, fully cultivate and to explain to a reading audience. Could it be fair to say that uh, that conflict probably began in the Continental Congress and the tensions? And one of the reasons why John Adams was, uh, you know, wanting someone from Virginia to help lead that army to help bind the colonies together. And yet that conflict was present right then and there. There's always been a regional divide in this country. It's a miracle that there was a union to begin with. The mm. regional differences were so strong from the very beginning. Uh, actually, in, you mentioned John Adams. He and Thomas Jefferson had a correspondence during the final year of their life. Of course, they died the same day, July 4th, 1826. Um, but Jefferson wrote one letter, which is extremely interesting regarding this particular topic. He said that the day might come when uh, the United States might be better separated into four or five different countries, because even Jefferson himself recognized at the time that uh, you can't have a republic, a successful republic that spans uh, an entire continent. That's not the way it worked in, in uh, the Greek democratic uh, Polish states. Uh, and so it, it, it's a miracle that the country still exists, even in the fashion it does now, uh, if you were to ask my opinion on it. Mm. You know, talk about the complexities. I One of my favorite books, I would have to say now, on the Civil War era is uh, Rebel Yell about uh, Andrew Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, which, by the way, we had a great opportunity to visit the Battle of Bull Run, the Battlefield of Bull Run, which is an amazing place. I would encourage everybody to visit the battlefields. But uh, Andrew Jackson... Um, or not Andrew Jackson, forgive me, uh, <laughs> General Jackson in the Confederate cause, he but he set up schools, Bible schools, for slave children, and he was threatened. They tried to stop him from doing it, and he's like, no, I'm sorry, you can't stop me, I'm going to do it anyway. I mean, the, the complexities, the, the sort of the, uh, the myths and misconceptions about the South, I think, are so, so uh, prevalent today that people have no idea what the actual, like you mentioned Jeff Davis a minute, a minute ago, people don't really know what uh, General Lee or General Jackson or the other, others in the Southern cause felt about slavery. They just assumed they're all evil racists, is something you said a second ago. 
Right. Um, well, since 2015, uh, the, the, the South has once again become the nation's whipping boy. This goes in cycles. This happens in every, every generation at least once, uh, and where something terrible occurs and the popular media and, and the government institutions, the bureaucrats, want to find somebody to blame for it. Usually they're going to blame the American South and the fact that there at one time existed a confederacy that attempted to destroy the United States. Well, first of all, that, that in and of itself is wrong. Uh, the, the confederacy never attempted to destroy the United States. There would have continued to be a U.S., but there would have been a separate union, a confederacy in the southern part of the country. This is a, an, an extremely difficult subject, but mm. um, the South is an easy target for modern liberalism. It's an easy target. <laughs> and over the past eight or nine years, what I've told people is that it's not the fact that the confederacy once existed or that slavery once existed in this part of the world. It's the fact that when people look to the South, they see the cross. They see people who are still motivated by the cross of Jesus. And that's something that they cannot tolerate. The Marxists, the liberals, the bureaucrats, the popular media cannot tolerate anybody who recognizes that there is an absolute authority in God himself. And that's kind of where I want to go in the next segment because we're right up against a break right now. We're talking with Dr. Alan Harrelson. The Pipe Cottage, pipecottage.com is his website, pipecottage.com. He's got two YouTube channels. We're going to link to both in the show notes today as well as the website. But I want to talk about that coming up after the break. So Southern culture represents something more agrarian, something more conservative, something more family focused, something more Christian even. And um, maybe the war between the states isn't quite over just yet. And I wonder, I wonder, just wonder if if this might be a part of, you know, sort of the reconquista of our country in some ways. And I want to get into that with Dr. Harrelson after the break. And then hopefully we can continue that conversation in the after show and take your question because I'm seeing some good ones here in the chats. Go to thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT to get in on the action. More is coming up next. Share us with a friend. We'll be right back. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, if you haven't done so already, make sure to go to The Pipe Cottage and to Dr. Alan Harrelson's YouTube channels. Again, we're going to link to them in the show notes. And might I recommend, oh yeah, Dr. Harrelson reading Shelby Foote. I mean, you should create an entire ASMR channel just reading Shelby Foote in that beautiful South Carolinian accent of yours. I mean, it would make a billion dollars. Dr. Harrelson, welcome back to the show. Thank you for your time today. We are grateful to have you on. I'm fascinated by the conversation because I believe, and I think you alluded to this in the last segment, I believe the United States is still reeling. It doesn't know that it's still reeling, but I believe it's still reeling from the effects in the war between the states. I don't think it's quite recovered from that. One of the things that kind of, Oh, we, we, I was, we were driving to Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, you know, as a McLean, I wanted to go to Bull Run, where it all starts, in the kitchen of Wilmer McLean. The first artillery shell of the war lands in his kitchen. And then Lee surrenders in the same man's living room at the end of the war. So uh, we made that journey. We made that pilgrimage of sorts a few weeks back. And when I rounded a corner and I saw a sign that, uh, for Appomattox Courthouse that says, here. Is where the union was restored. And it struck me, no matter how you feel uh, about the war between the states, no matter how you feel, it made me think and wonder, I wonder what the local residents think of this sign. I wonder how they see this, uh, this, uh, this sign in, in regards to the history. So I want you to tap into that a little bit. Is the country still reeling from the effects of the war between the states? And, and then also, is the Southern culture part of the of how we take back our country. That's the other question on my mind. Dr. Harrelson, what do you think? Oh, I've got many, many thoughts about that. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, the 4th of July was not even celebrated in, in Vicksburg, Mississippi for 50 years after 1865. You mentioned you went to the Vicksburg battlefield. So that's, that's one example. Um, there was an excellent book published years ago by an English historian. Her name is Susan Mary Grant. 
and her book was entitled North Over South. And in this book, she uh, argues that what we have in the United States after the Civil War is not a true American nationalism. There's not real unity. We have New England nationalism writ large. We have two countries joined together by force of arms. The memory of that war when I was a boy and when my daddy was a boy was probably stronger than what it is now in the South. We're, uh, as I said previously, historical consciousness is really going by the wayside now. Uh, but uh, the, the memory is still strong, and the reason for that is this is the only part of the country that's ever experienced a true and drastic military defeat. Uh, the vision that the South had for its future in the 1860s, in 1861, was completely shattered by 1865. And the American South is a poverty-stricken part of the world until at least the Second World War. Mm. And so uh, we're not dealing with the economic turmoil of Confederate defeat now, but we are uh, dealing with a culture war. And so to answer your final question, um, I think that... Uh, Explaining history is is one side of the equation, uh, but what do we do with that explanation? If we're going to respect uh, certain aspects of Southern history, what do we do with that knowledge? Well, I think uh, restoring a culture takes a lot of time. It has to happen at the grassroots level. Uh, one of the best things we can do is fight against the revisionist historians and try to get people interested in the past again, uh, whether they're they're in the Catholic Church or not, uh, people need to be interested in the past because we're starting to, to repeat several of the same mistakes we've made previously. The one decade that people can look at in American history to explain greatly what's going on in our time is the 1850s because uh, we are, uh, I, in my opinion, on the verge of yet another serious conflict in this country. We're probably already in the midst of it now. That may not be a military engagement as it was in the past, but there are certainly high tension marks uh, mm. in, in American society today, economically and politically, of course, but also religiously and culturally. Uh, the United States is one of the most significant mission fields in the world right now. Uh, the, the Catholic Church is having to bring people from other countries to, to, to serve in local parishes in rural America because this country has become far too materialistic and worldly, for lack of a better term. Uh, we're, we're not raising up our own ministers, especially for the Catholic Church. And uh, so I think the time is ripe for a cultural restoration. But you can't restore something unless you understand what was lost in the first place and how it was lost. So there's a lot of work mm. to be done. Yesterday I saw a, a picture and a headline out of Breitbart. I'm not going to show it to our video feed, but I'll just explain it because it's pretty offensive. But it was a, a country star, a country star. And he was quoting, I guess he was at one of his concerts and he shouted out to his crowd, F Joe Biden, and then expletive, expletive, expletive Joe Biden. You know, and this is this has become America, right? Uh, we have mm -hmm. the conservative culture. What are they conserving? They're not conserving marriage between man and woman. They aren't conserving uh, the right, the dignity of life at conception to a natural death. There's a lot of things they don't conserve anymore. They don't conserve a balanced budget. They don't conserve that either. So there's a lot that they do not conserve anymore. And I, I always look to country music as like a like a canary in the coal mine, a litmus test of sorts, right? Country music used to be considered wholesome. It used to be part of that Southern culture. We think country music, we think Southern culture. And yet now it seems to be like uh, the high school cafeteria gone out of control. What say you, Dr. Harrelson? <laughs> well, if, if I wouldn't go as far to call much of anything coming out of Nashville country music these days. <laughs> It's a bunch of nonsense. To me, country music hasn't been recorded in the past 25 years. Uh, so I really, really think that that's not a good measure. Uh, there's, there's this lack of gentlemanly conduct when we are looking at popular media. I understand we've got people who are angry uh, with uh, Joe Biden, and I am too in a lot of, in a lot of ways. But uh, you've, got, you, you've got to uh, – we, we've got to do better than this as, as uh, conservatives. And the country is futuristic in its, in its outlook. It's not thinking about um, 
preservation in the way that you and I are speaking now. Most people who we're looking at on, on the popular media outlets, they are concerned with power and money on both sides. Uh, and so this is the nature of, of politics. You, you, it, and so I, I have little tolerance for the news media these days. I try not to even look at it uh, because it's the same story. People are just getting more angry with one another. They're spewing filth. And the Internet world has made this too easy to, to accomplish. Um, and even with my own social media outlet, uh, there, there's – a, a debate that happens every once in a while with something I say, and people can get pretty ugly. Uh, they would say things to you through the keyboard as a keyboard warrior that they would never say to your face. And so there's just a lack of decency, in my opinion, among Americans on both sides now. There was far more decency during the Civil War as a, as a military conflict than there is now. I can't imagine General Lee uh, speaking to General Grant uh, in the way that uh, the opposing sides uh, of the spectrum speak to one another now. So we've, we've lost a, an important degree of decency, and I think that's unfortunate. Uh, and I don't know what can restore that if it's not Christianity, if it's not humbling ourselves before the cross of God. And uh, I think the Catholic Church needs to play an important role in that. And, and quite honestly, I think we, we could be doing a better job. Last question before we say goodbye to the radio side. We're running out of time fast now, 60 seconds on the clock. It, the Catholic Church is growing in the South. Could you see uh, Could you see that having a drastic impact on Southern culture and the country at large? I wish it would, but that's mere speculation. We'll just have to see what the future brings. All right. All right, Dr. Alan Harrelson, we're grateful for your time today on the radio side of the program. I'm hoping you can hang out with us in the after show. We're going to continue our conversation in a much more casual, relaxed way. We'll be on the live video feed. If you want to be a part of that, go to the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT, where you'll be able to get access to the live video feed, as well as the, uh, the links just underneath where you can see YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, LinkedIn, other places. You can be a part of that conversation today. Check out the show notes. Everything we talked about is going to be linked up there. The station of the cross.com forward slash A C T. God love you. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. The station of the cross is brought to you in part by My Catholic Will. This Lent, consider making an act of charity by including the station of the cross in your will. We've partnered with My Catholic Will to make it easy and convenient to create your will, and it's free. Just use referral code 14 stations when you visit mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross. Again, that's mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone. Hey, good morning, everybody. Praise be to God. Janice, good morning to you there. Praise be to Jesus. Mateus and Jen and Mimi, T. Storm, good morning to you. Trad Jack Burton, James, 16897, Damon, good morning to everybody. Thanks for hanging out. Eileen, I, like, I see you there. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. T. Storm, good morning to you. Sharon, how are you feeling, Sharon? Glad you're on the team today. Thanks for hanging out with us. Troy Lockett, good morning to you. Praise be to Jesus. Lots of uh, great commentary today. Lots of interesting debate today. Doug999, good morning to you. Life with Yetis is back. Sci-Fi Mike, good morning to you. Gus DMH, glad to see you here. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, Anita, good morning to you over on Facebook. Uh, Jane, I see you there. You got a question I'm going to ask in one second. Just, just give me one second. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Linda, good morning to you. Lori, good morning to you. Patty, good morning to you. Praise be to Jesus. Junior Barra, Donald Paddock, thanks for hanging out with us on the team today. Rachel Jordan, good morning to you. Daniel, good morning to you. Praise be to Jesus. Liz Fench is here. Annie, Paul, and uh, Colin, Helen, Frank Rangel, Shaquille, good morning to you, Chesty Marine. I see Sharon there. Helen, again, Yvonne, good morning to you. Lights 10, Don the Highlander, good morning to you. Praise be to God. The Lost Creole is back. Glad to see you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, looks like uh, Stamper Tamper's not very happy today. Not, not, <laughs> not a fan, apparently, of, the, of, of good old Dr. Harrelson. But that's okay. We're very tolerant people for the most part. Yes. David John is on the team today. Good morning to you. KSB, good morning to you. Praise be to Jesus. 
Thanks for hanging out with us today. We really appreciate you guys being here today. Uh, Evelyn, I see you there. Good morning to you, Evelyn. Thanks for, for being on the team. Really, really like seeing you here. Dikari? Dikare? It's probably Dikare, right? There's an emphasis on the E there. Uh, good morning to you. Gregory, I see you there. Praise be to Jesus. Good morning to you. Um, I'm scrolling backwards. Let me know if you guys have any questions specific to Dr. Harrelson or anything you want to talk about is on the agenda today. Uh, yeah, there's a new Civil War movie out. Uh, Dr. Harrelson, have you seen the uh, the uh, the trailer for the new Civil War film? Is this the uh, film that's supposed to be set in the in Modern. today's period? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I saw yeah. a trailer for it, and I, I'm not going to watch it. I think it's bogus. I think it's a bunch of nonsense. it's propaganda. Uh, it's total propaganda. Which okay. Yeah, uh, I, Jane, I'm not going to, I'm definitely going to ask your question, but I have to go down the rabbit hole first. Uh, Dr. Harrelson, best Civil War era film ever. What would you say? Oh, Gettysburg, hands down. Uh, Gettysburg, Get, really? hands down. Mm-hmm. You, I was, Ron, Ron I was for sure you were going to say Gods in General. No, well, no, Gods and Generals had too much animation in it. it there, there's, <laughs> there's no animation in Gettysburg. It's yeah, the yeah. soldiers are real people all the time. Far more work had to go into making Gettysburg than making Gods and Generals because they probably had a, a better budget. So, yeah, uh, I think Gettysburg is by far uh, the, the best Civil War film ever produced oh, in this country. Okay, okay, sure, but... <laughs> Martin versus Duvall as Robert E. Lee. I mean, I, I, I'm a Duvall well, guy. Duvall was originally supposed to be General Lee in yeah. Gettysburg, but I th- guess he had other obligations. Uh, mm. Interestingly, Duvall was probably around that time uh, researching his movie, The Apostle, which came out Whoa. in 98, I think, uh, which, yeah. was, which was very good, a, a movie about uh, – Southern evangelicals, primarily the Pentecostal strain in uh, Louisiana and Texas. And so uh, Duvall, uh, Duvall, John Wayne, and, and Jimmy Stewart are my three favorite actors of all time. <laughs> and uh, But, uh, yeah. yeah, but but Martin Sheen did a, did a well enough job, I think. He uh, was, was not as keen uh, with, with General Lee's character, I think, as Duvall was. Duvall claims to have descended from General Lee in some fashion, and I think he still has a – Horse Farm in Virginia. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, that's my answer. Gettysburg. Gettysburg. All right. Uh, so uh, f- best or uh, who's the who's the better actor to portray General Jackson? Was it the Gods and Generals guy? I, who's na- He's from New York. I forget his uh, name. General, the, the actress General from New York. Jackson, uh, Stephen Lang. Stephen Lang mm. played uh, General Jackson. Stephen General Lang. Jackson was not in the movie Gettysburg because he was dead by the time yeah. the battle happened. I, I thought he uh, was so portrayed he, in that film. Uh, I guess I was mistaken. Not unless the ghost of General Jackson finally uh, (laughs) erupted from the soul and we... uh, Lee would have preferred a flashback. They didn't have a flashback scene in Gettysburg? I I thought they did. I thought they might have, like, flashed back to earlier in that, but I might be misremembering. Yeah, see, I was mistaken, too. I thought that they portrayed his death in that film. Mandela effect. The, the, no <laughs> sir, no sir, no sir. It, Gods and generals is the all is all you get. Stephen oh, Lane yeah. played General Pickett in Gettysburg. That might that's be what's oh, why. That's why because he go. was a different character. Yes. Okay, okay, different all right, yes. different character. All right. So Jane is asking. Uh, she wants to know uh, what you thought about the PBS Civil War documentary that was done. Did you think it was fair? You mean Ken Burns' documentary from the early 90s? Is that what she's yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah, that was the one that Shelby Foote was a part of, right? Yeah, Shelby Foote was the best part of that documentary. Uh, and he he spent too much time, uh, again, trying to portray the South as, as just a bunch of uh, evil rednecks who whooped slaves all day long. Uh, and so I, I, it was good. I, I didn't think it was as balanced as it could have been. But if a similar, a similar uh, documentary would have been made today, uh, they, they would not ask somebody like Shelby Foote to be on it because because mm-hmm. Foote was certainly not ashamed of his Southern heritage in, in his no. Confederate history. He had, yeah. he had family who fought in the, in, from Mississippi. And uh, so I don't think that that documentary could be made now. The country's changed far too much since the early 90s. It's changed too much in the past 10 years. I've, I've watched it just decline. So anything, people are scared to speak about the war anymore because they're afraid they're going to lose their job and scared of what people's going to think about them. And it's happened in the history profession, too. It wasn't this bad in the early 90s when Ken Burns made his documentary. 
Mm. But now you, it's, it's as if it, it's the people who write about the history of the United States, you almost, if you're not going to be writing about race, class, and gender, uh, if you're not going to be writing about slavery, you have to explain why you're not writing about those topics before you write about something else. And <laughs> yeah. I had to do that in my own dissertation. The dissertation committee said, well, why are you not writing about these other popular items? I said, well, <laughs> if the profession is going in one direction, that's usually a good sign, and I need to head in the opposite direction. Yeah. You know, I'm, it's so – I'm, I'm not – it's I'm not so, an optimist when it comes to uh, uh, the history profession. I'm not an optimist with that. I think the best histories over the next few years are going to be written by people who are not inside the profession. Shelby Foote, the people within the profession have never respected him. He didn't even finish an undergrad at the University of North Carolina. But he was a better researcher and a better writer than 95% of the people uh, who are supposed to be writing American history now. His book on Shiloh is graphic. Oh, my heavens, the details in that book. I mean, the way he describes men dying, whew, man, it left scars in my mind just going through that. So uh, Shelby Foote's an, an amazing man. God rest his soul. Um, but what I guess going back to something I said on the radio side is just how I love history. I thought I loved history. I mean, I always loved history. Loved history. It's my favorite class for uh, in school growing up. And, and I, if, I have to, if I read entertaining books, it's usually history, history books. I like going through history. So I just thought I knew more than I did. And I was surprised at what I had learned. And I almost didn't end up making my documentary film because I kind of got so sidetracked on the Civil War that I had to like stop and refocus myself on the project that I was working on. I was so fascinated with what I was learning there, the, um, the complexities of the Civil War. That, you know, we we're told South evil, North good. Read Dagger John. You know, the Archbishop of New York, uh, you know, Archbishop Hughes gets sent on a PR mission throughout Europe to combat, you know, the PR mission of the South and tries to fill boatloads of Irishmen to die at the cannon, you know, or go watch, uh, go watch uh, Matthew McConaughey's uh, Free State of Jones and get a sampling of uh, during the during the Civil War, how freed slaves and whites were combined in a community during the war, like in Mississippi, you know, it's just, it's just so much more complex. And here's the thing, and this is kind of want to get your comment on. So when I, vi I remember when I visited uh, the, the Vicksburg battlefield and we went through that and you look at the community around the battlefield today, General Grant, he makes it his solid mission you know, 18, winter 1862 going into the spring of 63, he's like, I'm getting into Mississippi one way or the other. Come hell or high water, whatever it takes, I'm getting it done. So he does. May 19th, he arrives at the doorstep of Vicksburg after fighting all those battles consecutively. General Johnson doesn't even bother to come to the rescue. Pemberton, the, the, the Yankees, all by himself to, to fight off General Grant. General Grant, as we all know, uh, ends up with this siege after losing thousands of men in the attempts to, to, to attack Ends up in a siege July 4th, 1863, on the same day as Gettysburg, gets the, gets the final victory and the city is, is surrendered. He paroles the men. The slaves are freed, but he pulls chocks and leaves. He's not at all interested in hanging out in Vicksburg. He's gone. Go there today. Did we free those well, people? Did we free? Here's the question. Did we free those people? Did we help those people? The slaves? Did we help them? Did we free them? Or did we leave them to the slavery of poverty? Because their remnants are still there, it seems. And it feels like an injustice today. Again, I hate to keep going back to foot, but I think he was also right on this as well. A native Mississippian in, in himself. Um, he and several others have argued over the years that Reconstruction did more harm than anything. Uh, to to reduce the ability of black Southerners to make a living for themselves over the course of several decades. You take a, 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 an entire population of people uh, who have not been in society and you just throwing them into a society situation saying, here, just do the best you can. But in fact, that's what the federal government said we were going to do. But that's not what the Southern planter class did. Uh, many of these black families continued to stay on uh, land that they had known, that they'd raised children on. Uh, 
And, and I don't want to paint a picture of slavery as being this, uh, you know, this wonderful, beautiful institution. It was a harsh reality of American life for a considerable amount of time. Uh, but with my perspective on that is deciding what should have happened to the institution of slavery should have been left up to the individual states to, to decide. Uh, that was not a federal issue because what happens as a result of the Confederacy being defeated, you have a federal government that is without boundaries uh, when it comes to power. And uh, whether you agree or disagree with the federal government in uh, uh, becoming involved with the institution of slavery uh, at that time, the fact remains that it set a precedent for the federal government becoming involved in other aspects of American life later on. And uh, when the federal government passes the income tax amendment in the early 20th century, that gives them the finances they need to do basically whatever is required on behalf of, of ex- ex- whoever's in charge of the federal power. Mm. We shouldn't be as concerned about who's the president. It, 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 sh- it was never supposed to matter this much who the president is. Uh, I remember reading a story years ago uh, when George Washington was president and he was making a tour of the South and uh, his aides told the governor of Georgia, said the president is coming into your state and uh, we would like you to prepare for his arrival. And the governor of Georgia responded to Washington's camp and said, when the president is within, is within the confines of the state of Georgia, uh, he will be under my authority. I am not Ooh. under his. <laughs> and, uh, and so this, and it, there, there is this uh, notion of states' rights that is very much a part of the Civil War period, and that is still an issue that we're talking about now. Uh, the real issue at hand is not did the South fight for slavery or not. That's a historical question that we can talk about with historical uh, research. Uh, but you, you've asked me several times, what are the lasting effects of the war now? Uh, it, it is still this notion of local versus uh, uh, at the federal power, a local versus federal power, state versus federal power. And uh, the federal government's too large. It's been too large for a long period of time. The Constitution doesn't work if you don't have federalism. That's the core of the United States Constitution. Uh, James Madison, and, and, it, and it may seem like we're going from one side of the equation to the other, but you can't understand the 1860s unless you understand the American Revolution. They, they, they are connected uh, because what's happening happening in the 1860s is two different interpretations of both the American past and the American future, two different visions of the future. Uh, and so we, we go back to James Madison. He's writing during the Constitutional Convention, or maybe he wrote this in the Federalist Papers. I can't recall. But I know it was Madison who said it, that the, the, the powers that are delegated to the federal government, the central government, as he would have called it, are few and defined. The powers Mm. that are retained by the states are numerous and infinite. The U.S. Constitution is a few pages in length. Almost every state constitution is far more lengthy lengthy than that. Um, So it shouldn't matter as much as it now does who the president is. But unfortunately, uh, there's, there's a massive amount of authority in Washington, and that is a direct result of the Civil War. Yeah, I find it all very, very fascinating. And you're right, it's so connected, the whole thing. And and it's I think it's most Americans don't think about it at all anymore. They don't make these connections. You know, going back to just bringing up the slavery thing one more time, you know, think of you. I've heard you talk about this. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, he inherited so much debt. And that was part of the reason why he had to keep the slave population just to try to cover the base. And because the debt was so large. Uh, and yet he had uh, he had talked about how he thinks that they should be freed. General Lee has talked about it in his correspondence with his wife. General Jackson, uh, uh, you know, treated slaves so well that he had a reputation, and people wanted them to wanted him to buy them so, buy, so that they would be treated better and be better cared for. Uh, uh, Jefferson Davis, Jefferson Davis lamented the the secession. Yeah, he wanted to see this being solved in a in a much more uh, in a in a calmer way, a better way, or whatever. So it's like the complexities of all of this. But I, I want to I also want to pick your brain about sort of go back to the Catholic angle in the antebellum period. It seemed like the Southern cause had more Catholic support than the Northern cause did. Is that is that accurate to say, or how do you see it? 
Well, I've not studied those numbers. Uh, I'd, for the past several months, I have been enjoying the uh, fruits of our newfound faith. I have not delved into the numbers of the Catholic Church North and South in, in the antebellum period. But I have come across a wonderful book written by Adam Tate. And uh, I think he t- he's Catholic, and he wrote a book uh, recently about uh, Catholic leaders in antebellum South Carolina. And uh, I think one of the points, I've not read the book yet. I just read a couple of reviews of it. And I think one issue that he discusses is there was, in fact, a growing Catholic community in the South Carolina low country before the Civil War. And uh, he may, in fact, be speculating as to what would have happened had the war not come about because it just disrupted the growth of this uh, of the Catholic community in the South. If it did anything, it disrupted that growth. Mm. Uh, many people um, were were of course, not Catholic. I'm not, there's no reason to suggest that the South was predominantly Catholic, but it was overwhelmingly Orthodox, small O Orthodox, traditional Christianity. Um, there, in, in Whether it's high church or low church, traditional Christianity is the bedrock foundation of the way many people are not only viewing their culture in the 1850s in the South, but also viewing the conflict itself. General Jackson thought he was fighting in the army of the Lord. And this is a quote from the historical record that actually made it into the film gods and generals that you mentioned earlier. Uh, but that's not to say that there are not also very serious Christians in the American North who are fighting in the Union Army. Uh, I would probably say that Catholicism is stronger in the North than it was in the South, but that's not to say that uh, traditional Christianity was stronger in the North than it was in the South. Right. Uh, yeah. There were is that there were many uh, people who were who were playing around a great deal with uh, <clears throat> what's the pragmatism this this philosophy of pragmatism in the American North this notion that your truth can be different from my truth as long as we agree to get along and then that's mm-hmm. fine this is the product of an industrial industrial civilization. Uh, the North had already developed a very strong industrial economy, a diversified economy prior to the war. And this is one of, one of the reasons that they were able to win this conflict. One thing that Shelby Foote said that I have never agreed with, he said that the American North was always fighting that war with one hand behind its back. And if things got pretty testy, uh, all that Lincoln had to do was call up more volunteers, and they easily could have won that war one way or the other. I, mm. I think General Lee whooped them pretty good at Chancellorsville, and he came close to doing it again at Gettysburg. <laughs> and um, I think it, 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 the, the first American Revolution, we would not have won it uh, had we not received support from the French. We didn't have the power to do it. Uh, wow. And what Davis was hoping would happen is the Confederacy would gain recognition from either France or Britain mm-hmm. and have military support to bring an end to the conflict. And it came close. We came close to having at least British recognition uh, in the earlier part of the war. But uh, you asked me a question that I could talk about for a considerable period of time. <laughs> and it, 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 we could you go know, that's okay. on and on. This is the after show. It's fine. <laughs> uh but I, I, are there any other oh. questions or concerns my, my, that are on your my, mind? By the way, my son is back here. He, my son never gets up this early uh, to hang out with his dad <laughs> at work. But today he was like, Dr. Harrelson's on Pff, the banjo player. Oh, man. He's like hanging out off to the side over here. He's like <laughs> trying to filter me questions that I can barely hear. him. He wanted to point out the Pope's uh, the Pope's recognition uh, to uh, Jefferson Davis and, this, and the Confederate cause. Jeff Davis went to a Jesuit school, so he had a Catholic connection there. Again, a very complex situation, to say the least. By the way, Sharon, Sharon, you continue to be an amazing supporter of what we do. So God love you. Thank you, Sharon, for your generosity today. It says, congratulations, Joe, on your documentary award. Yes, I can officially say I'm an award-winning documentarian now. My documentary film on the end times won an award at the film festival for the industrious family film out in Idaho over the weekend. It came first in class for the documentary category. I came fourth overall, but, uh, but first in class for a documentary film. So thank you, Sharon, by the way, you can watch that film in the iCatholic radio mobile app. It's in the ICR plus tab. It's free. Check it out, watch it, share it with a friend. I'd be grateful to you. Uh, where I, I actually tell you the story of that, that, that how Peter and Paul make it to Rome and how they, they die there, in fact. And I guarantee you, you're probably going to learn something you did not know before. So check that out in the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Sharon, you are amazing. God love you. Thank you for it. You know, uh, couple, you talked to, you mentioned Shelby Foot a minute ago. 
There's, there's a couple more things I really want to get in here. One is uh, what I'm about to say about uh, something you said about Shelby Foote, but another is about Celtic versus Norman, you know, like uh, like sort of the lowland British uh, that, that conflict that happened. That's that's basically explains a lot about what goes on in America that we don't even think about. We don't even know about the Celtic South versus the Norman North. It's Jacobite versus Protestants. My son is over in there feeding me. It's hilarious. Anyway, uh, let me start. Roundheads. That's right. Let me start with the with the Shelby Foot thing. So a second, <laughs> Joe, 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 such a kill. Thank you, Evelyn. I appreciate it. Thank you, Deborah. You're amazing. God bless you. Anyone heard of the Civil War sub- submarines? Yes, the Hunley. Praise be to God, Alberta. Thank you for hanging out with us today, Scribbler. Congrats. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, Alberta says he prefers Norman. You mentioned a minute ago about Shelby Foote saying that the United States fought the Civil War with the with one arm behind its back, that it could always do more. But that's one of the things about the conflict that I think most Americans would be appalled at today. You know, uh, the march of General Sherman, who some say was possessed, but, you know, he was a disturbed person, to say the very least, could have been possessed. I don't even know. But his march, his his, you know, burn it all down. Uh, March left a huge swath of destruction in its wake. Um, basically, when 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 Lincoln said the key to winning the war was Vicksburg, I get that key in my pocket was because he wanted to seal off the South and having full control of the Mississippi River was key to that. So taking Vicksburg, taking New Orleans, sealed the entire South off, cutting Texas, Louisiana out of the deal, Arkansas out of the deal. And then um, basically at that point, starving these people to death. Shelley Foote, he talks about the behavior of some of the soldiers, like the sniper, the famous sniper of Vicksburg, who built himself a tower out of railroad ties and uh, just started sniping innocent people across the, the works there in Vicksburg, just, just shooting them down. Like, how is this good behavior? You know, and again, General Grant, he's an interesting character, General Grant. He throws his men into combat and he fights, as Lincoln says, I can't spare this man. He fights. And a lo- thousands die under his command. I mean, in fact, Pemberton begs Grant to hold a ceasefire just to clear the dead off the battlefield because the, the, the rot, the smell, the stench was so bad. Um, and yet, at the surrender, April 9th, 1865, at the Appomattox Courthouse in the, 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 the living room of Wilmer McLean, he is as most gracious as he possibly can be to General Lee and to the soldiers, giving them parole bringing up the printing press so that they can print out the parole papers so every man can go home instead of fighting again. And he tells the guy he leaves behind to, to ensure this thing is finished, be as generous as you can. Anything that you don't need to take back to Washington, leave it here. Let the locals take it. Wagons and tools or whatever. Tell the cavalry men, keep your horses. You're going to need them to plow the fields back home on the farms again. Like, can, can you help me understand that? Like, is war just hell, but peace is peaceful? Like, And then, of course, you go into the what you mentioned a minute ago, uh, and I'm just trying to put all these pieces on the table so you can comment on it. So you get the, uh, you get the post-Civil War era where they reoccupy the South, and you get the hammer laid on the South at that point. Help me understand like, sort of the schizophrenia that we see in the wartime. Well, I'll draw your attention to yet another book uh, published – some time ago now, but I think the thesis still holds merit. Uh, in the 1960s, a book came out entitled Cavalier and Yankee. And uh, William Taylor, I think, uh, is the author's name. And he makes an interesting point. He studies the travel journals and diaries of people from up north who are visiting the south during the uh, antebellum period. And what he noticed is um, most people who were traveling – were able to see that the South was so different from what they had experienced before in, in their homes in, in northern states that the, the, general, the general consensus among these uh, journals and diaries is that if we are to maintain a union, the South has to change. It either will have to change through culture and persuasion or it will have to change through military conquest. Mm. And the, the second is, 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 is what happened. Uh, in Reconstruction, 
is ugly. It's very ugly. The violence doesn't stop in 1865. General Wade Hampton from South Carolina, who was the cavalry commander uh, under uh, General Lee uh, at the time of Appomattox, he tried to persuade General Lee to to participate in guerrilla warfare. Let's take the Confederate Army into the mountains and let's follow a guerrilla warfare pattern. And Lee wouldn't have anything to do with that. He said, if I can't defeat the enemy on the battlefield face to face, I'm not going to hide and try and do it behind a tree. Mm. Uh, And so this was, this was an honorable and we have to be careful in saying that everybody who lives in the South is honorable and everybody who lives in the North is, 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 is is not, (laughs) Uh, there were good people on both sides there. But as with any culture, You've got your good and your bad elements. Uh, but what, what I lose patience with is people who are not able to understand that there were human uh, complexities in the South just as there were uh, up North. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that when the country was founded, slavery existed in almost all of the states, North and South. It wasn't simply a Southern institution at the time of the Revolution. It was only in the... Uh, years uh, after the ratification of the Constitution that uh, slavery eventually became uh, illegal in many of the northern states. Some historians argue that was because of moral issues. Uh, Others argue it was because of no economic reason for it anymore. Um, So I've got a lot of ideas about it. There was certainly this, ironically, the, the federal government, probably would have treated the South far better had Lincoln lived. Uh, I think that Andrew Johnson was a much weaker president, and he allowed the radical Republicans in Congress to essentially, they impeached him, of course, but they just ran right over him. Uh, The executive branch under Andrew Johnson was basically non-existent. Uh, And the radical Republicans under Thaddeus Stevens and people of that nature truly did think that the South uh, needed to be uh, conquered. Uh, Sherman. Uh, was also of that opinion. He said that there's a certain class of people in the South that need to be eradicated, and we need to essentially colonize the area, repopulate it with people from other parts of the country so that we can finally uh, get rid of the backwards uh, uh, Southern culture. And, uh, yes, the South was pre-modern and pre-capitalist in many ways. Uh, But I don't think that that's a bad thing. I I go back to what I said in your uh, radio program. Uh, Alan Tate made the wonderful point about this. It was essentially a medieval society in many ways, and the South was never as comfortable. And John Crow Ransom made this argument. And all this is fresh on my mind right now because I'm writing an essay about it, and I'm writing a couple of uh, talks that I've got to give in different places. So John Crow Ransom, uh, who was also writing with Alan Tate in 1930, said that the South was never as comfortable removing itself from European society Uh, as the American North was. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, the Puritan faith that existed in the American North. It simply was not predominant in the South. Uh, High church, Episcopalians, Presbyterians uh, were were certainly more. Some of the oldest churches in South Carolina are Anglican. Uh, So these people are by no means Puritan. And so there's an interesting religious divide there that I think also helps explain regional differences. Yeah. I was getting in. I, in fact, when I visited the Appomattox Courthouse, as I uh, took some of my kids with me, we um, I asked the uh, the park ranger who was telling us the story. You know what? Uh, what was the best book I could get on Wilmer and the background? She, she showed it to me, and I was able to get a copy off a used copy off of eBay, which you know, read through the whole thing. It was fascinating. He talks about how that branch of McLean's goes back two revolutionary era times and how their great grandfather fought there. In fact, some paintings uh, of George Washington crossing the Delaware include him in the boat, which is fascinating. And uh, they talk about that Anglican connection, the Episcopalian church there and how they started out George Washington's church, but they didn't like a pastor. So they went and created their own and, and, and uh, Wilmer's daddy actually helped to pay for the building and the whole, the whole thing. So it's all very fascinating, which leads me to that next question about Celtic, the Celtic influence on the South, something I've heard you talk about. So the Irish were the, some of the first indentured servants, the first slaves to come to the United States were the, were, uh, were the Irish in, in the colonial days. And then we see a lot of Irish coming in, um, not just after the war, in, uh, but before the potato famine's what, 1840s? So that's 
Mm. We're, pr- we're reasonably sure that's where my great, great, great grandfather came over in the 1840s, 1850s or somewhere in there. And uh, again, he fought for the 6th Missouri Confederate in Vicksburg. So the Irish, the Scottish, which is our heritage, uh, they come over and they tend to go into the Carolinas, Virginia, the Carolinas, through the south, into Kentucky now, as the, especially after, after the end of the Revolutionary War, the, the Ohio Valley opens up and people flood in there. Um, versus the north tends to be the lowlands, as you say, the lowlands and, and you know, and, uh, and the rest of, of England. Tell me about that strange conflict between these two groups of people seemingly from the same part of the world, yet that conflict that's kind of there in England and Ireland and Scotland is finding its way now in America. And what's the influence there? Well, it is a transatlantic story. Uh, prior to the American Revolution, most people in this country still had their face towards Europe. They were still very much influenced by the politics and the culture of European society, British society. Uh, and so um, after the revolution, uh, the people start facing west and are more interested in expanding the country into uh, more Western environments. And it's not people from primarily New England in the American North who are settling these new areas, Ohio Valley, Kentucky, and so forth. They are uh, primarily from the Middle Atlantic states and the old Southwest region, which at that time was Alabama and Mississippi, that area. It was settled by people from the Carolinas. Uh, so these they were interested in having land. This was a land-based society. Um, people in New England were already developing a diversified economy by the time we get to the late 18th century uh, through uh, cotton mills and textile industries. None of that was in the South. Uh, and, but there's a beginning to be a land shortage, and people are not able to buy and procure land nearly as well as they used to. So that's what's pushing westward expansion is the desire for land because land is capital. Land is something that produces independence for a family. And the historian Lacey K. Ford called this country republicanism, uh, that the, the need to own land was at the center of not only Southern society, but most of American society uh, during the 19th century, even after the war. It's not New England people who are settling the American West. It's former Confederates uh, and families uh, of former Confederates going out West to essentially escape the memory of, of loss to try to mm. build a new home in a different part of the different part of the world. Uh, so, is there an important thesis there? And this is an old thesis now. It, it began in the 1980s. Grady McQuinney wrote his Cracker Culture. It was published in 1988, I think. Uh, and he, he made a, an argument that there is a more significant Celtic influence in the American South, and that, per, that perhaps helps explain some of the regional differences. Now, when that book came out, another book was, was, was also published at the same time, uh, David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed. And in Albion Seed, there's a discussion of four, I think it's primarily four regions within the British Isles and how the different uh, cultures within those reg- regions are transplanted to North America. And he does speak about the lowlands around uh, London, and he gives a wonderful uh, chapter to uh, the Celtic fringe, Ireland, Scotland, Mm. Uh, Wales to a certain extent. And uh, even in the American South, there is a difference in the culture of, if you take the state of South Carolina, and this used to be more noticeable than what it is now, but it used to, used to be the, the low country had a significantly different culture than the up country. Uh, the up country was primarily cotton plantations and small yeoman farms. The low country uh, was primarily rice plantations. Most of the money uh, that was made in agriculture uh, prior to the Civil War, in South Carolina at least, was from rice uh, production. Mm. And so uh, there, there's, it's not simply a north and south uh, uh, regional divide. There are regional differences within the South itself, because the South itself is just as large as the entire European continent. Wow. <laughs> if you take the former 11 states that officially joined the Confederacy, and there are two more stars on the, on the battle flag for Missouri and Kentucky, uh, if you take those states and you combine them, the land area is larger than Europe. South Carolina wow. is geographically larger than Scotland. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
you have different uh, you have uh, the, the highlands of Scotland. You've got the lowlands of Scotland. And it's the same thing with many of these uh, states in, in, in our own country. And I think it's more beautiful to see culture in a more local way like that. I, with mm. this large homogenized this large homogenized American mainstream national culture where everybody's got the same restaurants and stores and franchises on you know the little strip that goes down the four lane out of town um, that's ugly all of that is just an ugly culture there's nothing beautiful about it when I was in Ireland a few years ago I love the fact that their villages stop and then the countryside begins. There's no urban sprawl. You have the village, then you have the countryside. Two distinct places. Um, and they don't have to compete with one another. But what we have in this country is a serious competition uh, between an urban culture and a rural culture. And that is what's interesting me more so these days than anything else. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't really think that much about the Civil War anymore. Not right now. Um I did that for so long, and I can talk about it, but I think that the more instructive divide uh, that we have has come about in the past 100 years. And it's this drastic division between people who have a rural sensibility and people who grew up in cities and in suburban America. Uh, I I think that is perhaps the most important way to explain a culture war in the United States now. We can we can do that in other countries as well uh, because the and I'll just mention this and shut up. <laughs> if you take a person who was raised during the first part of the 20th century and they live to the second part of the 20th century, that generation saw more cultural and economic change than perhaps any generation of people since the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and so I think we need to consider that because the, 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 the United States in 1920 was still overwhelmingly rural. The United States in 2020 is not primarily rural by any means. And yeah. I remember when Trump was elected in 2016, it took people by surprise because it was an overwhelming turnout of rural America. Uh, it is primarily rural America that helped him get elected in 2016. Hmm. And there were probably people in in rural counties who voted for the first time in their whole life Mm. because they were fed up with the Obama administration. So um, it's, it's a huge topic and it's fascinating to, to consider this local culture is, is what I support. And I think that's, that's what we need to have more of. Can I I interject here real quick? Just as, so I I grew up most of my life in the country. Um, I, I went to college, got a history major uh, a lot of my working career has actually been in construction. Uh, maybe can you discuss a little bit of this? There's kind of it seems to me like in the in a lot of the modern rural culture or kind of you know what's the word? It doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be rural, but kind of that. Um, but it tends to be on the rural side. But there seems to be an almost often a willful anti-intellectualism kind of that takes root, it kind of takes hold in, in the countryside. And to me, that's a serious issue to address because it, it only hurts the cause of, you know, defending rural ways of life and and maintaining, you know, a, a culture, a civilization, when you have this sort of, you know, a, a school. I, I don't support, you know, college and higher education for everyone. I think it's not designed for everyone. But I also think that doesn't have to accompany, you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater just because the current state of academia is so, you know, corrupted and so filled with with propaganda. Um, it's kind of a rambling question, but maybe you can, you can kind of kind of address that because that's something I've really noticed in 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 my life so far. Yeah, that's an old problem. Mm. The uh, Southern literary renaissance begins in the interwar period. Uh, the 1920s through the 1930s and 40s. There's a massive amount of intellectual activity happening in, get this, urban areas in the American South. It's not happening in the rural counties. There's a a massive, uh, there's a literary renaissance happening in Charleston, South Carolina, which is very, very important at that time in, in the intellectual history of the period. Then you've got uh, places like Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Vanderbilt University, 
Uh, then you've got uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which is also a center for intellectual activity. So you're right in pointing out that there's not a lot of respect for intellectual life or intellectuals among many rural families in rural counties in the country even now. And that's not simply a southern issue. But what I have discovered is that there's a growing interest on behalf of rural Americans for somebody to help others understand their philosophy and their way of life, Mm -hmm. their approach to American identity. They themselves may be hard at work trying to make a living for their family. Uh, And and so I think they just don't have time to to read books all day and to write (laughs) essays, uh, explain it. They're too busy keeping a job and putting food on the table for their wife and children. Mm -hmm. I think that's an honorable way of life. And uh, I think that uh, to be a good husband and and a good father is the highest calling Mm -hmm. uh, outside of the ministry that a man can have. Mm -hmm. So I don't fault those people at all, but there is this need for intellectuals, writers and thinkers to help explain this rural philosophy, this, this, alternative perspective, because that's really what it is. It's not mainstream. It's an alternative America. You, you've got to explain it to people who are mainstream because these people deserve respect. They deserve uh, uh, to be respected for the way they are in their own way, preserving a traditional American culture uh, better than many of us who are in the academic circles are able to do in our own lives. Um. So I think it's not mutually exclusive. You need people in a healthy society who are writers and thinkers. You also need people who are hard at work uh, farming and in agricultural enterprise. I wish more and more families would become involved with agriculture. Uh, I think that's also key to preservation of a lasting culture. There is a growing Catholic land movement, too, right now. I mean, there's a lot of Catholics who are looking for farmland and trying to homestead and figure out how to milk cows and make cheese. And, you know, we, we, we talk to them on occasion here. In fact, there is a Catholic land movement conference coming up in Ariesville, New York, of all places, mm-hmm. your backyard tragic. Of burden. all places. I think it's been there before. <clears throat> you know, I know. I'm just saying it. The shrine of the North American martyrs. I know. So the shrine, which is a beautiful location. <laughs> it's a beautiful location. Yes, it it's cool. That is a beautiful part of New York. It's unfortunate. New York is run by the people that it's, that runs that, that, cause it's a beautiful state. <laughs> Yes. But uh, you should check it out, the Catholic land movement. We're, you know, uh, can I ask not, you, Dr. Not Harrison? Far, not, har- not far from here in Buffalo is a town that unofficially seceded from the Union and joined the South. Yeah, I know. There's the stories war. like yeah. that all yeah. over the North, yeah. by the way. Town, town line, New York. It's, it's yeah. like a few, yes, exactly. few miles from the studio. <laughs> it's my own my own home state of Missouri. It's, it's, that's its tragic history. It's just the, the divide just within the state was so, so fierce. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Harrelson, you mentioned a minute ago liter- literary works. My daughter wanted to ask this question. What would you say are some of the greatest Southern literary works ever or even just over the last hundred years or, or whatever you would suggest? Well, there is a long uh, literary history in the South, but most of it that's approachable to us now, it comes over the past 100 years. I would encourage people to read, uh, particularly if you're in Catholic circles, read Walker Percy and Flannery O'Connor. Mm. Um, Walker Percy's essays, he's got a, an essay collection, and it, but his stuff is pretty deep. If you try to read one of his novels, the, the, it requires your full attention. You can't do that in multitask <laughs> at the same time. But his, his, his essays can be quite instructive. Uh, to, I mean, Peter Kreeft, is a, is a major fan of, of Walker Percy. And uh, when I was exploring uh, the Catholic Church, I picked up Kreef's book, 40 Reasons Why I'm a Catholic, and he had a chapter in there uh, <laughs> on Walker Percy. And, and he quoted Percy as, uh, somebody asked Percy, he said, why are you a Catholic? And Percy quite simply said, what else is there? <laughs> and uh, Amen, I man. think so, – so Flannery O'Connor, she's a wonderful short story writer. Mm-hmm. She's got a collection of letters that she that are now published that are extremely instructive. Flannery O'Connor, just a little story about her. She uh, lived in Milledgeville, Georgia, in Andalusia. That was the name of her home. Mm-hmm. And there was a young man in the community who looked up to Miss Flannery, and he was getting ready to go to New York to go to college. And he asked her one day, uh, he said, uh, Miss Flannery, I, I don't know exactly how to act 
uh, in New York. I don't know those people. I've never been there, but that's the school I want to attend. And her response to him was, uh, when in Rome, do as you done in Milledgeville. <laughs> <laughs> and great. so it, just, uh, just be yourself. Uh, um, and, but um, uh, the, I, my, the list just keeps going and going in my head about books to recommend. Actually, what I'm going to do is put a couple of videos up on my uh, YouTube channel, one of them about recommended mm. uh, literary uh, pieces for people. So keep a, a lookout for that if you're interested. Walt Whitman, was he uh, Was he the Southern? Walt Whitman. No. I'm trying to look. No, he was born in, I'm looking it up right now. He was born in New York. New York. New York City. Well, isn't there a commercial like yeah. that? Where's this New from? New York City. It's New the, York. Isn't that the salsa? It was, a, it was the, the Picante salsa, yeah. salsa commercial yeah, from right. 1980 whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. It, it, I, gotta, I wrote um, in my in my dissertation. I wrote a chapter on Harriet Simpson Arno, who was actually I didn't know at the time when I was writing about her that I would buy uh, land just south of where her farm was, and mm. so she was from uh, Pulaski County, Kentucky. And she wrote a book, I believe, in the 1950s entitled The Doll Maker. And it was made into a film later on uh, and had Jane Fonda in it, if I'm not mistaken. And she um, she wrote a, a story about Kentucky, a Kentucky family who had a hard time making a living on the land. And they had to move up north to uh, the Detroit area so the husband could, could find work. And so the, the whole point of the book, it, it said a lament of the loss of an old rural culture in their part of Kentucky yeah. and the ability of Kentuckians to, to maintain that way of life, even in the middle of the 20th century. So uh, the doll maker is a very, very good read that, that uh, the I think maker. the doll, it, it, it describes the greatest internal migration in American history, the greatest yeah. internal migration where people are moving off farms, moving to towns uh, to find work. And it's, a, a tragedy, and so I can't recommend that book highly enough. Agrarian peasant, welcome to the team today. Thanks for hanging <laughs> out with us today. By the way, Sharon, God love you. Have a great day. Thank you again for being generous. She said to say hello, John Paul. She said to say hello. She, you met Sharon when we were at uh, giving the talk at the parish in New York, in uh, New Hampshire. Back in the day, Sharon's been an amazing supporter of what we do here. But uh, Agrarian peasant says, would love to hear Dr. Harrelson speak about the Catholic history of Bardstown, Kentucky. Kentucky has a, got a, a very Catholic background to it. I'm a little worried about its current uh, Catholic city, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it does have a, a fantastic Catholic root for it, for sure. But it makes me want to ask the question, all right, Dr. Harrelson, let's see here. You've become Catholic, so welcome home. Glad you're here. I would like to ask you how that happened. But you, you smoke a pipe, okay? You appreciate the agrarian lifestyle, the Catholic, the Catholic gentleman culture, um, I don't have to be a rocket scientist or have a PhD in history to come to the conclusion that you must be a monarchist then, and you must wear wool, <laughs> apparently. So, uh, I mean, clearly you're a monarchist, right? Like, how, how do you feel about the monarchy? Well, is, mo is monarchy the best form of government? Is it the only God-designed form of government? I mean, I don't want to trigger certain well, producers who may have alternative opinions, but I'm just curious what yours is. My, well, my opinion is that I've often wondered what would happen if we had simply stayed within the British Empire. Uh, I tend, I, I, I tend to, I tend to think that uh, in many ways we would have been better off because we mm -hmm. weren't the only ones paying taxes uh, after yeah. the French and Indian War. The mm -hmm. People in England them, th themselves were paying higher taxes than we were to help fund that conflict. That's true. Uh, and so I am not uh, one of those people that. Uh, thinks that we got everything right, that America has always been exceptional. Uh, I, I'm not a follower of the MAGA crowd in that regard. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I do think that, I, I do think that uh, there's a lot to be said for monarchy. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to <laughs> get into something that's going to take that's a solid answer. <laughs> hour to talk about. Gentlemen, I don't have very much longer here to visit yeah, with you, but – uh, do you have one or two final questions? I'll ask one last question here. It came from Nick the Mike, one of our insiders and friends here. Nick the Mike asks whether or not you can maybe uh, speak on any Masonic connections to the Civil War. 
Seems like uh, most of the founding no. fathers. By the way, I was a Freemason for a long time. My father, uh, 32nd degree, still active in the Freemasons. I, I renounced that when I became Catholic. But uh, yeah, so what would be your what would be your take on the on the Mason connection to the Civil War? Well, quite simply, uh, I don't know. I have never been interested in that question. I've never actually thought about it. Uh, I, I, I don't know what. I don't know. I mean, that's that's all I can say. I, I, I honestly cannot speak to that to that question. All right. Praise be to God. Well, Dr. Harrelson, we are so grateful for your time today. Uh, you have been a fun guest to, to talk to and to think about and uh, discuss these these deep and profound questions that probably would need hours and hours and hours and lots of ink spilled to really get to the bottom of it. But uh, I really enjoy the conversation. Thank you for doing it. God bless you and God love you. Thank you, sir. Enjoy it. If you haven't done so, check out his YouTube channels. Uh, I would encourage you to get to the Pipe Cottage as well as his other channel that's more new. It's the Dr. Alan Harrelson. We're going to link to both in the show notes today. And if you haven't done so, check out his banjo playing. It is really, really quite good, actually. My family has been enjoying it, and I think yours will as well. Hey, coming up tomorrow on the show, I'm very excited because we're going to have uh, Fatima Center on the team tomorrow. We're going to be talking about... We're going to be talking about First Saturdays. Have you committed to the First Saturdays? You should do so if you haven't done so. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. God bless you. God love you. Have a great day.